Good day everyone and welcome to Managerial Economics. So our reference is from the book of Brickley Smith and Zimmerman. It's called Managerial Economics and Organizational Architecture. Okay, our first video lecture is all about the book title itself, Organizational Architecture. But first, let's lay out our learning objective for this video lecture. First is to define organizational architecture and discuss how economics can be used to help managers solve organizational problems and structure more effective organizational architecture. Second would be to define economic Darwinism, Darwinism and discuss its implication related to the benchmarking of business practices. So organizational architecture. What makes up an effective organization? And how does one seek a systematic framework in addressing organizational problem? So in this book by Brickley Smith and Zimmerman, they have identified three critical aspects of a corporate organization. One is the assignment of decision rights within the company. Second, the methods of rewarding individuals. Third, the structure of system to evaluate the performance of both individuals and business unit. So let's look at these three critical aspects through an example. Let's look at a company, the Enron Corporation. It was created by merger of two gas pipeline companies. So from gas pipeline it became the world's largest energy trading company so enron was largely credited by creating market trading in energy allowing energy to be traded in the same way as other commodities such as oil and it's because of the um, seizing the opportunity of deregulation energy deregulation in the u.s so what happened Convince that the regulation of energy business would create opportunities for firms with a vision to recognize and the willingness to exploit them. Enron moved aggressively to build and implement an innovative business model. The U.S. government began to lift controls on who could produce energy and how it was sold. Then here comes new suppliers which came to the market and the competition increased. So, but... However, the price of energy became more volatile in the pre-market, okay? such as um, in distributing power, okay? what used to be as monopoly to protect the consumers, it is now um, utilities competing to win consumers and contracts on the basis of price. So, ganon. Enron garnered tremendous recognition for their accomplishment that it was named the most innovative among the fortune's most admired company list. And Enron operated in several um, business segments, but their three main business units would include the wholesale services, which provides energy services and other products to energy suppliers and other firms, their retail business, offering business customer energy products and services and their broadband services, providing various services with access to fiber optic cable network and other businesses and other businesses such as the water resources and wind energy. So to finance this rapidly expanding array of businesses, Enron relied to its bright young CFO, uh, Andrew Fasto. So what happened? Okay, so aside from tapping on additional sources of debt and equity capital, ang ginawa ni Pasto, he made use of partnership whose financing detail were kept up Enron's balance sheet. So hindi nakareflect, such as when they finance their water business, Enron formed Azurix Corporation and raised $695 million by selling one-third of the company to public investor. 
So aside from that, um, Enron also form partnership, okay, like the Atlantic Water Trust, which hold 50% stake, and the Marlene Water Trust, okay, which marketed institutional investors. So to attract more lenders, Enron guaranteed the debt with its own stock. They said that if their, if their credit rating fell below investment grade and the stock fell below a stipulated price, Enron itself would be responsible for the partnership's $915 million debt. So as long as the company is growing, okay, um, the cost... Okay, the cost for the company would be um, of little okay, effect. But what happened? Okay, several of Enron's business segment began to experience significant problem. There came along the energy crisis in California. So in the mid-1990s, California was faced with uh, crippling energy bills and changes in the federal regulation that encouraged um, deregulation. Big businesses and energy officials thought that they could lower energy prices by forcing utilities to compete with other companies. So, um, here comes Enron, okay, who argued their case for deregulation. So, the deregulation talks focus on a centralized energy market that would handle both the physical process of delivering electricity and the financial market a model used by most deregulated energy market. So this plan was eventually implemented and created separate entities and fewer regulation. But in the late summer of 2000, a power shortage in California resulted in blackouts. So Enron was blamed by state politician. So California launched an investigation in price gouging by Enron and other power marketers. So aside from their um, California business, um, Enron's investment also in Brazil and England ran into political obstacle. Enron also had a 65% stake in a 3 billion power project in India, but the power plant became embroiled in dispute with its largest customer who refused to pay for electricity. So another mega problema na naman, okay? Um, the terrorist attack in um, September 11, 2001, okay, which um, resulted to oil prices, okay, to fall, generating losses for Enron's trading operation. So after reaching a peak of 70 billion, reaching nearly 70 billion. In August 2000, Enron's market value collapsed. So its bankruptcy filing in December 2001 is one of the most spectacular business failures ever seen. So the Business Week suggests that Enron's problems were rooted in a fundamentally flawed organizational design. At fault were three key aspects of the company's corporate structure. First, is in the course of flattening its management structure, Enron delegated an extraordinary level of decision-making authority to lower-level employees without retaining an appropriate degree of oversight. Second, performance was evaluated largely on near-term earnings growth and success in closing deals. Third, the company offered enormous compensation to its top performers which encourage excessive risk taking. So, Enron's internal risk management group was charged with reviewing deals, but the performance appraisal of 100 employees within the group were based in part on the recommendation of the very few people who generated the deals. So, Enron's problem appeared to stem at least in part from its organizational design. Look at, let's look at the components no, of architecture, organizational architecture that was discussed in the book by Rickley, Smith, and Zimmerman. So here comes the three legs of the stool, the decision right assignment, 
the reward system, and the performance evaluation system. Okay? So, um, Business Week identified the problem based on organizational architecture. So, let's look at it based on these three legs of the stool. The decision right assignment. So, um, the decision making authority um, was designated to lower level employees, okay, without retaining an appropriate degree of oversight. So, that's what occurred with Enron. With the reward system, the company offered enormous compensation to its top performers, okay? So when you reward them so much, they become excessive risk takers. With the performance evaluation system, how did Enron evaluate their employees? It's, it is largely relying on near-term earnings group and success in closing deals. And performance appraisal of their 180 employees within the group were based on recommendation of the very few people who generated the deals. So, Enron's problem appeared to stem, at least in part, from its organizational design. So, economics has long been applied to questions of pricing policy. For example, how would raising the price of the product would affect sales and firm value? So, we address standard managerial economic question which includes pricing, advertising, and scale, and the choice of inputs to employ in production. So, these same tools are used also to examine the organizational architecture. For example, how changing a division from a cost center to a profit center change incentives, alter employee decision, and impact firm value. So, for example, in designing an organization, it is important to keep in mind that individuals respond to incentives. Managers and employees can re be resourceful in devising methods to exploit the opportunities they face. So, but um, this also means that when their incentives are structured inappropriately, they act in ways that it reduces the firm's value. So we use economics to examine how managers can design organizations that motivate individuals to make choices that will increase a firm's value. For example, evidence suggests that a problem highlighted in a company box on chief executive officers slashing R&D budgets prior to their retirement is not widespread. The research suggests that these perverse incentives can be controlled by basing CEO's incentive compensation on stock prices and managing CEO succession so that the decision rights are gradually transferred to the successor over the years prior to the final departure. So it is important to examine how managers can structure organizational architecture to motivate individuals to make choices that increase the firm's value. So let's look at a managerial application. Creative responses to a poorly designed incentive system. So a manager at a software company wanted to find and fix software bugs more quickly. He devised an incentive plan that paid $20 for each bug the quality assurance people found and $20 for each bug the programmers picked. So since the programmers who created the bugs were also in charge of fixing them, they responded to the plan by creating bugs in the software programs. So this action increased their payoffs under the plan. There were more bugs to detect and fix. The plan was canceled within a single week after one employee netted 1700 under the new program. Okay, so that was under his manager's journal, the Dilbert Principle in the Wall Street Journal. Another managerial application, the economic incentive in the subprime mortgage crisis. So, itong subprime mortgage, they were um, made for borrowers who do not qualify. Okay, 
for standard market interest rate because of problems such as their credit histories no? or the inability to prove that they have enough income to support the monthly payment. So, um, kaya nabuo tong subprime mortgages. In March 2007, the value of U.S. subprime mortgages was estimated to be 1.3 trillion, okay, with over 7.5 million mortgage outstanding. But the second half of 2007, um, banks, mortgage lenders, real estate investment trusts, and hedge fund reported losses of close to 100 billion as a result of subprime mortgage defaults and devaluation. So the stock market fell and became quite, quite volatile as more details about the mortgage crisis were revealed over time. And one important factor that contributed to this crisis was the incentives of the mortgage brokers. So the issue here is on looking at the underlying problem on organizational architecture, no? the incentives and the decision right assignments, which would have helped managers anticipate this type of problems. So let's proceed with economic Darwinism. We're all familiar with this principle developed by Charles Darwin, the survival of the fittest. So economic Darwinism, um, it means that the competition, okay, the competition will um, without the ill-designed organization which fails to adapt. Competition in the marketplace provides strong pressure for decision-making, okay? And that includes the organizational decisions. Competition among firms dictates that those firms with low cost are more likely to survive because if firms adopt in inefficient then high cost policies then it will um, it will be enabled to adopt and eventually close a study suggests that the form of organization that survives in an activity is the one that delivers product demanded by customer at the lowest price while still covering their operation costs. But, but look at Apple. Okay? It's expensive. Okay? What do they offer? What do they offer? Why they have the position for the top-selling mobile phones? Why is it? It's because customers are willing to pay Okay, exceeding the cost, value proposition, value creation by the company. So, the real point here is an appropriate architecture can lower costs by promoting efficient production. It can also boost price customers okay, willing to pay, customers are willing to pay, by helping to ensure high-quality production, reliable delivery, and responsive service. Looking at the biological, scientific standpoint of Darwinism, okay, um, Darwin analyzed that the major forces at work were random mutation in organism, but merong external factors that affect change, no, such as the weather, okay, um, and other environmental factors. But relating it to economic standpoint, these um, um, changes are for first full and voluntary. For instance, the case of Pepsi and Coke. So in order to compete more effectively with Coke, Pepsi copied many of Coke's practices. Pepsi spun up its food fast food chain to focus on its core business, just as Coca-Cola had done. So also, Pepsi changed its network of bottlers. Okay. One analyst remarked that Pepsi is starting to look a lot more like Coke. In fact, this practice has been formalized in the process of benchmarking. 
benchmarking generally means looking at those companies that are doing something best and learning how they do it in order to emulate them. Because of course, if these if are an organization practice, an efficient system, any company would want to adopt it, such as that if the Toyota will be on the cover of Fortune reports, managers across the country will read it and ask, would that work in my company too? So undoubtedly, manager with the strongest interest in trying will be those within firms currently suffering inventory problems. So some will achieve success, but others may experience disastrous results caused by unintended, though largely predictable, organizational side effects. So the concept of economic Darwinism has an important managerial implication. First, existing architectures are not random. There are sound economic explanations for the dominant organization of firms in most industries. Second, surviving architectures at any point in time are optimal in a relative rather than an absolute sense. That is, they are the best among the competition, not necessarily the best possible. Third, if the environment in which the firm operates if technology competition and regulation change, then the appropriate organizational architecture normally changes as well. So these three observations together suggest that although improvements in architecture are certainly always possible, a manager should resist condemning prevailing structure without careful analysis. So before undertaking major changes, Executives should have a good understanding of how a firm arrived at its existing architecture and more generally develop a broader perspective of why specific types of organization work well in particular settings. Finally, an executive should be particularly skeptical of claim benefits of proposed organizational changes if the environment has been relatively stable.